And that bike on Robin's wall is not actually a bike. And it took me like halfway through COVID to realize it's a picture or something. I have no idea. What is it, Robin? A picture? Yeah. No, it's it's actually like a piece, a of, piece, art. of, art, piece of art. Yeah. But it's it's aspirational. So as soon as the snow is gone, I can actually get yeah. out on my real bike. <laughs> podcast goosedigital.com episode 72 who do we have robin kroll you have david rewalt from action iq uh heidi smith from action iq and michael turksani welcome david and heidi great to have you on the podcast yeah great to be here today. now what like i like i say jokingly um we we're, we've got millions of views and a huge audience that watches this thing, but that's not actually true. But uh, we do, we, we, yeah, we do sponsor our, our little podcast snips. And actually, I was looking at last year's uh, levels, and I think we, we achieved close to 300,000 views of those little snips on LinkedIn and what have you. So we may get a little exposure here for, for the Action IQ team for sure. Um, today, we're talking about Action IQ. The partnership that uh, that we've been working on together uh, as a as a partner that's certified and one of the first through kind of the the batch, I guess about a year and a bit ago, Robin, getting getting people yeah, in our yeah. organization certified and and um, and knowing the, the the platform and super excited to be participating in content with you guys. Um, why don't we start with um, David and then we'll go to Heidi in terms of your role and and you know what's exciting to you and kind of what you focus on today. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so um, at Action IQ, I'm the Senior Director of Marketing Services Partnerships. Uh, so I'm you know, primarily focused on, you know, building partnerships with our system integrators and, you know, folks like that who are building a practice around our technology to, you know, solve problems inside of, of their customers. Uh, for me, on the B2B side, I've got a long history with B2B, spent time at Oracle, spent time at Adobe. Um, primarily focused on B2B technology. Um, so this is near and dear to my heart. And I'm, I'm kind of excited to talk about, you know, where technology like ours comes into play in a modern B2B tech stack. Awesome. Heidi? Sure. Um, Heidi Smith, I've uh, been in financial services most of my career and most of that time in MarTech. So. Uh, have had the great opportunity to sit on all sides of the desk at this point. Uh, landed at Action IQ about six months ago, and I'm really glad to be here because I spent a lot of years on the other side of the table trying to figure out how to bring together this mess of data and marketing technology stack uh, in a way that we could really make it work for our customers and never really found the holy grail. Uh, I believe that our what we're doing at Action IQ and our tool set uh, really gives our customers uh, an opportunity to take things to the next level in a way that we've not seen in the market before. Um, so great to be here. Uh, look forward to talking about these things. Awesome. Yeah. So maybe in terms of tone setting, because I thought I think where, where you went started to go there, Heidi was uh, was kind of bang on from um, how we got kind of really excited about Action IQ. Um, it was introduced through through your chief revenue officer that knew us through from another platform organization, but also knew that we were a company that focus on focuses on business outcomes, you know, driving performance through through campaigns. And as, as we all know here today, or, or really should that, you know, the data that, that we have available to us really makes that possible. So we were stretching I would say stretching marketing automation platforms and probably internal IT organizations to to really give us the type of data that we would need to bring these campaigns to, to, to new levels. So when we started, you know, getting exposure to Action IQ and the types of possibilities that the platform unlocks, we were like, oh, well, this this makes, you know, perfect sense. And, and a lot of the work that we're doing over here actually is you know, time and, and cost and, and having a, a platform over here gives us much more agility um, on the inside. So that's really, you know, what, how we got excited about about the platform and we can we continue to be excited. 
I would say, why don't we get into like, what's, what are you guys seeing from like the front line, talking with customers, talking with sales, like when they think of CDP, when we're, when we're in conversations, there's still kind of somewhat of a knowledge gap. So I think certainly for the Goose customer base and even some of our largest organizations, you know, they're, they're still put, trying to get their arms around executing effective automation campaigns, let alone, you know, getting their CDPs in order and then their tech stack in order. So why don't we start with like, what are some of the common themes, common pains that you guys are, are seeing and then subsequently helping them solve for? Yeah, I can start with that. I mean, when you think of uh, in sort of in the topic of B2B tech stacks, you know, uh, you, you kind of have the usual suspects in most of these tech stacks, right? You're going to have a CRM like a Salesforce or a Dynamics, right? That's going to be bi-directionally integrated with your marketing automation platform, you know, your Marketos, your Eloquas, your HubSpots, your Actons, and so on. Um, you probably have some sort of ABM tool on top of that, like a Sixth Sense or a Demand Base. Chances are you're enriching your data with Dun and Bradstreet or something like that, right? To fill out those profiles more. Um, and then, you know, you probably have some sort of lead scoring mechanism in place um, to sort of have that handoff from marketing to sales. Um, and, you know, in most cases, people feel like, oh, that's a fairly healthy, you know, operational model for them. The challenge sure. comes when you get into, well, how do I really do two things well? One is create super effective, highly targeted audiences across that ecosystem, and then execute to those audiences with a true omni-channel approach, right? So when you think of marketing automation, you kind of think of very email-centric type approaches, maybe SMS and push, perhaps some integrations with a call center, that type of thing, or passing off data and leads to you know a sales system of some sort. Um, and then you think of the sales team sort of maybe having a bit of a dashboard look into their leads or opportunities from an event perspective and what those prospects are doing inside their view in the CRM, right? Through some sales tools that the marketing automation uh, provider provide. But what you often see happening is a lot of this other data that has blown up over yeah. the last 20 years to 15 years, 10 years even, um, is not available to that business. Right. It's not available to the folks who are creating the audiences. And, and so you have audiences getting created ult ultimately in multiple tools. Right. So, you know, they're they're taking event stream data coming in, you know, to uh, the website that's pushed into the map program using that plus account and profile attributes to create basic audiences inside your marketing automation platform. But then they're only executing to a handful of channels from a workflow perspective. Um, Yet they've got transactional data, they've got call history data, they've got call dispositions, they've got um, invoice data, you know, they've got CRM additional data, they've got all this other stuff that isn't being used in those audience definitions. Um, and it's hard to push all that data into a marketing automation platform. Yes, many of them have, you know, uh, provided functionality for custom data objects to do that but you're kind of jamming, you know, a round peg into a square hole a little bit there. Uh, yeah, and we've tried, they're never we've tried. designed for those levels of, of, <laughs> of volume. They're, they really weren't designed for the type of scale that the data operates at today. So, um, you know, when I think where does the conversation around say an action IQ come in, it's around, Hey, we solve for that. Right. Um, any thoughts on that for you guys? I mean, does that sound fairly spot on to start the conversation around? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the whole, uh, you know, round peg in the square hole. If I think of, you know, some of the ways that we have uh, helped our clients optimize either their marketing automation platforms or even their CRMs, trying to get all of that data into one of the two platforms or both and to be able to, you know, build these really uh, rich audiences it's been really challenging. And for a lot of organizations, those have been the platforms that have been available to them. So there has been no other choice. And, you know, that's why the, you know, the, the rise of the CDP is really exciting. 
Um, you know, the other thing, David, is you're sort of describing all those different uh, sources of data and channels. I just get this vision of all these mm -hmm. silos lined up right next mm -hmm. to each other, right? The silos, the silos don't yeah. talk to each other and customer, customers are not silos. B2B customers are not silos. They're, they're very much a composition of all of the data and interactions across all of those. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about what the CDP can really fill in. In, in yeah, and likely you'd mentioned sort of, you know, the the ask of IT and the burden on them to sort of help solve some of this as well. And, you know, I think the other variable that it's coming into play more and more is you talk to any organization and, you know, they've got some sort of data warehousing or data lake project underway, you know, to consolidate mm -hmm. all their data in, you know, a Snowflake or an Azure or an AWS and, you know, the, the, in their view of the world, that that's where they're trying to break down those silos that Robin speaks of, right? They're like, well, we'll put it all in a data lake. It's, but yet it's still not really available to the business, you know, because which marketer is going to go write SQL, for example, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's an interesting approach, and you know, the the when I was doing a lot of consulting work actually at clients, that was always the the running joke is, let me guess, you're you're ten years into your five year data lake project, right? because <laughs> um, there's no yeah. there's no finish line to that right yeah um so well and i think heidi what's your take well i just i was just going to add on to what what david and robin were talking about the other aspect of that is the resource strain that it causes in the organization right because you're trying to use tools that may or may not fit what you're actually trying to accomplish or you might be 10 years into that data lake project that was supposed to be over five years ago that that david mentioned and you know, you can't unlock the value of that data either because you don't have the right resources to do it or the data's in the wrong hands or it's in the wrong platform or all of those things. And, you know, once you get to a place where uh, the data can be optimized and, and the, the power of that data can be unlocked by the marketers or the business users, you solve a whole host of downstream uh, resource gaps and problems and overload that can be redeployed to do things that are far more meaningful and innovative in the company and the tool can go do what the tool ought to be doing. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, actually this has been a good, uh, a ground, a ground layer of the challenges that, you know, we all have today in marketing. Uh, we've sort of touched on kind of the broad tech stack, but really creating, I put down like smart, you know, smarter audiences in a sense, because, you know, even when, IT is creating something off a definition that's being provided to them in a ticket or a request, you know, it's still a very asynchronous process. You know, there, there's a, okay, ask for it, get it back. Is it actually what we, what we think it is? We're not sure. And then, you know, a platform like, like Action IQ is allowing the person that's actually making that quite, oh, you know what, we should have had this in there. Or actually now that we see the data, it's not what we were thinking. Now we're back and forth, back and forth. So I think we kind of laid a bit of the stage in terms of, I liked the two pieces and we should come back to it after in terms of creating these smart audiences and then executing against those audiences. But it just dawned on me as we were chatting, like maybe we should take a slight step back and either one of you guys can sort of take this or both in terms of riffing on it a bit. Why don't we actually talk about like, what is Action IQ? What does it do? Just just to sort of like as a CDP in the space, what what do those things do? And maybe a bit on you know why people should you know really be looking at Action IQ over some of the other ones. Heidi, if you want to take that, I, or I can, it's up to you. No, go ahead. And David, you know, just to make it more complicated for you, uh, so because you come from that space, it might be helpful for folks hearing this. You know, there are a couple of really key differentiators for us, uh, kind of over the entire market. Uh, that I that I can think of, yeah. you kind of highlight that in the ecosystem. It might be helpful for folks. Yeah, it, it's interesting because you know when you throw the word CDP out there, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, it's a it, it's an a, a quickly emerging market that is ill defined in many ways. Um, so you know if you talk to eight or ten different marketers and say, hey, tell me what a CDP is and what it should do, you're going to get various answers in terms of what they think. Uh, those platforms should execute against, which is why when you go to look in the market and say search for one, you're going to get, you know, the Library of Congress in terms of point solutions and big cloud solutions and all kinds of things. 
So, you know, for defining it from an Action IQ perspective, you know, we think of ourselves more of a CX hub um, where, uh, you know, you're basically going to do all of your complex audiencing uh, inside of Action IQ and use that to orchestrate um, to your activation channels. You know, that's the real basic thing that we do really, really well. Um, and yes, we do other things like data collection, this, that, and the other. And we have modules for, you know, lots of different things. But at the core of our, you know, and our strength is really around that advanced audiencing. To your point, you know, smart audiences where, you know, I can interrogate the data as a business user without having to be technical, um, get an audience count back in minutes, and see, oh, well, what if I add this criteria in? How does that change? you know, the size of my uh, addressable audience for that particular campaign that I might be looking to do. And then go experiment and test against that as well. Uh, those things are really powerful things because to your point, you know, if you're pulling list, you're going to get the list you asked for and that's it. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, but that's, uh, but that's a really, you know, sort of interesting thing. We do put out a, what we call our CDP market guide. Um, which I think is a, a helpful tool. If you guys haven't seen that, you can download it from the Action IQ website. But it, it categorizes um, the space a little bit um, because it is it is a confusing sort of emerging ill-defined space. So we've given our POV on how things sort of should play out. But you know, from an Action IQ perspective, we think, hey, smart hub. There's sort of a CX hub, essentially designed. Um, for that complex audiencing and the ultimate uh, orchestration to your activation channels is really where we sit. Heidi, anything to add to that? No, just to, uh, uh, maybe just a quick double click into the, the point about putting the data in the hands of the marketers. You know, most of us who sat on that side of the desk know you want to go pull a new list. It, you're not doing that in real time for the most part. You're going to wait three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and that's <laughs> irrelevant. And so it's uh, it really is... is changing the way that marketing organizations are able to work and the agility with which they're able to address their customer audiences. So it's, it's really a, a little bit of a whole new day in some of these industries when they get their hands on this technology where marketers in real time can go make adjustments to those audiences and not have to ask somebody to write SQL or pull a new list and, and then sit there and, you know, and wait for that data to become irrelevant in the market. So. Yeah. And, awesome. and what we've seen, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, no, please finish the thought. I was just, yeah, was just going to say, uh, you know, and what we've seen, you know, in terms of that playing out to Heidi's point is that's happening inside of our biggest customers. They've gone from months and months often to get campaigns out the door to days. Um, they've gone from, you know, five, six hundred different audiences in their stable to thousands of audiences. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and increased both audience creation and campaign velocity um, exponentially. And I think, you know, when you look at what that does for an organization, um, that means revenue. That means cost savings and efficiencies. It means all yep. kinds of really good things. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's the, it's time, the time to value. To value. Well. I'm yeah. just and we've saying, had, yeah. Uh, to David's point, we've had we've had customers literally come and say, you know, we've got our initial use cases in production, it's exceeding our expectations, and now we're looking to go deploy this in places that are cost centers for us because we know we can make them profit centers. And when you get to that kind of story, uh, not just in the marketing con context, but in the operations of these large businesses, and that was that example is from a, a large insurance company. So it's it's. Uh, it's applic applicable in spaces where you, you might not initially see until you, you know, you see the power of it working inside your organization and unlocking some of that value. Yeah, yeah. And I see, you know, it's a good point, Heidi, because I think when I look at where we see a lot of value for like you guys at Goose Digital is you guys can come in and often answer the question of where do I go now that I've got a CDP, mm -hmm. right? I've, I've, Worked with Action IQ to implement my first two, three use cases. We're seeing tremendous value from it. What next, Goose? Tell me what to do, right? And you, that's where you guys can come in and your, a lot of your services really help accelerate even more value with what we do. So we're excited to be partnered with you. Yeah, so that. when you think a couple of things that you guys both brought up and we're, we're chiming in on, I think are, are really important because when we, when we, um, 
we go back to sort of like what's the fundamentals in a campaign, right? Mm -hmm. um, audience is like a core, comp it's, I would argue it's like the, the core component. And then you've obviously got, well, what value proposition am I laying on? Creative, you know, there's all kinds of things that kind of, that, that, that drive in many ways drive the definition, but the audience itself is this fundamental building block. And even to the extent that you can determine, I think one of the things that you said, that said David was, how many people are in this audience and, and allowing a business user to sort of riff on that a bit and go back and forth and kind of determine ties directly to campaign estimated campaign ROI and other types mm -hmm. of, of, of forecasting that you might want to do. It's like, well, now that I've seen how large that audience is, you know, maybe I want to cut it back or again, maybe it's not as large as I, I, it should be. So let's look at, at developing that or, you know, even just answering questions about what we think it looks like to begin with this, this fundamental component about an audience as a building block to, you know, forward campaign thinking. And to, to the extent that we use that in our estimates to communicate to the business, what we think this is going to drive in terms of value. It, it's so, it's such a, it's, it's your point, Heidi, on like changing the way these organizations are, are marketing, I think is a really kind of an interesting lens because you're right like if it takes two to three weeks and 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 we know it does if not longer and we're probably doing many of the same things every year because that innovation is somewhat challenging right like i can't go and ask for 10 things even if i wanted to so i may be at best trying to innovate on what i can do and, and then stitch around the edges now all of a sudden it's like well if you're not innovating if you're not pushing yourself to really dig into those audience building blocks and find different so you're almost you know you're almost kind of not doing your your job as the marketing leader at that point because you do have this technology at your fingertips yeah that's a really interesting point and when i think about um you know some things that sort of come out of that you know the ability to do that rapid exploration and experimentation of the data against audiences uh it it also helps you unearth you, the attributes and the things around what are your best audiences that give you the best ROI? You know, what things do I go and create, say, my lookalike attribute model around um, so that I can go after new prospects and start to really grow outside of my, my install base? And I think, you know, you get to those things much faster when you can do that, that sort of really rapid exploration. Yeah, and just thinking of can... Heidi's... Oh, sorry. Just saying, oh, Heidi, your so comment well. about. I'm just gonna say Heidi's comment about you know when you when you're requesting a list, you're getting the audience that you expect based on whatever preconceived notions you have of a high value audience and at risk audience. So you're you're missing so much opportunity because you don't have that exploration. So what you believe is a high value audience, maybe that's not your top tier audience. What you the audience that's risk, maybe you're at you're missing some of those at risk customers because you're not you don't have that opportunity to do the exploration and then you are limited to those use cases i just think of a couple of the ones uh you know heidi you were talking about you know looking at cost centers um i know david some of the things that we've talked before of using the audience not just for growth but ways to to actually uh reduce uh reduce spend or mitigating risk and these are use cases yeah. that are often they're not often as they're not looked at as often because they're much harder to get to because there isn't yeah. that ability to, to query and explore the data and make decisions and then execute them. Yeah. Well, it, and I think, you know, you make a really good point there is, is historically you've needed a number of systems to sort of manage the customer life cycle from anonymous all the way through retention. Mm -hmm. and, and those lines are now blurring right into a single system of record, which is generally a CDP. And I think that, you know, to reduce cost at things that are typically like a call center is a perfect example. How do I reduce my call center cost? Right? Well, if now I have the ability to feed call outcomes, dispositions back into uh, the CDP for additional segmentation, but also understand how to orchestrate my journey to, you know, not have to have something go to the call center. Those things add up to, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of savings for, for any company. And it's not hard to do 
if you have this stuff in place right. So let, maybe we we'll talk about two things um, as we move forward here. Um, I'd like to explore a little bit if you guys could kind of get into, you know, what's the type of data that you're seeing? Because one of the things that came up at the beginning of the podcast was, yeah, you know, the answer is the data lake. And that's what these IT organizations are implementing a big enterprise data warehouse. But it's not we're not that's not apples to apples because it's still now got to go through you know that process and it's not in the hands of the business but what are you guys seeing from like this other data that's now being kind of ingested and, and leveraged i think that would be good to touch on the types of additional sure. data that you guys are are seeing as a common thread um and then yeah let's let's do that and then we'll do the second one so can we talk a little bit about like what, what are you guys seeing in terms of the data that you're pulling in and, and leveraging uh, I can go, Heidi, if you, unless you want to. It's up to you. No, no, no. Chime in. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm hogging the conversation. No, um, no, no. All good. Yeah, you know, so when you think, and I'll try to put this more in the lens of like a B2B context as well. Um, you know, when you think about like you have your sales opportunity account system of record generally in your CRM, right? That's where the sales teams work primarily and the revenue and finance teams work in, in those tools. Um, and they're, they're going to continue to work in those tools. Um, and then you think about like your marketing automation platform where, you know, there's a handoff between those two systems, right? I'm passing accounts and leads and I'm nurturing them through my marketing automation platform, trying to move them down the funnel and that sort of thing. But there are other types of data to your question that often don't make it into the consideration set when building an audience. Uh, some of them we mentioned already, call center dispositions, data around that kind of stuff transaction history um, you know especially when you get into mm -hmm. these um, you know yeah you certainly have your longer considered purchase b2b cycles if I'm gonna go buy a fleet of you know tractors or something that's that's a much longer considered purchase but you also have high velocity b2b businesses which operate very much like a retailer e-com type of scenario and that transactional history all of that kind of stuff um, often doesn't make it into you know, how you factor things. Um, so, and I think the other thing that is often not in that ecosystem much is the ability to use uh, MI and machine learning uh, and AI based models to sort of inform decisioning as well. Uh, the ability to bring that all yeah. into one system, segment audience against it, is gonna start to unearth um, more insights than you could do with those systems separately. And I think that that's, you know, a couple examples of the type of data we see, you know, um, in most ecosystems that aren't making it into a lot of the audience consideration. Anything to add, Heidi? Thoughts? No, I would just say that I think that's part of the great thing about Action IQ is wherever you've got a pocket of data, it's pretty easy for us to be able to bring it in and create some meaning from it. So it's... Uh, it's unlike a lot of platforms in that way. It's not difficult for us to consume lots of different types of data from different data sources and incorporate that into something that's going to generate meaning for that marketer. So regardless yeah, of where, and I think from, just to add add to that a little bit, um, you know, again, knowing that there's still sort of misinterpretation, confusion, um, a lot of education that's still sort of happening, particularly in the B two B space about where does a CDP fit into you know, my B2B organization right? yeah. and, and what does it solve for? Um, you know, most CDPs kind of were born out of a retail example, right? Not a B2B type of thing where it's a very simple, uh, you know, end consumer type of profile. And when you layer in the complexity of hierarchies, which you have in B2B, you have you know, not only the account and the people rolling up underneath that account, but you have, you know, divisions, you have geography, you have, you might have four, five, six, seven layers of hierarchy that you've got to go design an audience against to try to get to, you know, that buying committee or that sort of thing. Uh, and that's, most CDPs can't do that. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things where with our audience capabilities that we do really, really well. Um, and, and I think that that's often a piece that is, you get a little bit of that in your marketing automation pl um, you know, platform because they're designed to sort of have account and lead 
um, objects that work together and you can you know sort of segment against it but again it doesn't often have all this other data that you want to be able to sort of segment against um, and you want to also bring in offline data did they attend that you know lunch and learn that you had did they come to the webinar all these other things that sometimes can get into your marketing automation segmentation criteria but often don't or in a very manual way do um, and so I think you know this is a way where you're just saying hey let's centralize that process let's make it rapid and let's allow you to really iterate quickly. And I think there's a, a an element that I think, I think you might've touched on this Heidi, just in terms of like how marketing is, is changing for these organizations. And even if you're, you know, a relatively low number of transactions made rel relative to like a huge retailer or like even a mid-sized retailer, right? But very high value transactions, B2B type scenario, or if you're in a B2B where you have just a lot of transactions because you're it's a b2b like you said it's but it feels a bit more like a like a, a retail e-commerce experience but it just happens to be to be a b2b i think that there's this thing that the cdp the 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 action iq platform does that i i think raises the maturity of a marketing organization where you know, without it, as you, as you said, David, before the tech stack's a little bit disparate. It's it's kind of the the chunks that we've had for a while, and because none of them are really fit for purpose to say, this is how we're from a marketing from a business perspective, really going to manage our audience building blocks and our ability to execute. You kind of you're left with whatever you've got, and you're doing the best you can with the the pieces that you have to stitch together. Whereas you have an action IQ in the mix, and all of a sudden. You know, there's that accountability that that you I think you want to see from from marketing teams, and that they now can they can take on to say, yeah, well, this is our definitive, like you said, the one platform now that is the going to be the de facto platform for defi our definition and our ability to execute. I think that's super exciting because where else do we have that? There's not really a business system that that lives today that yeah, you could argue well, IT has a list of you know, segments that we've asked for, but there's nothing on our side that, you know, is that living, breathing piece of software that can manage that. So I, I think that that's another really cool thing for marketing teams going forward. It's like that maturing of, of the, of this space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Cause you know, I think that often is whether you're a marketer or, you know, whatever sort of business user silo you're representing, right? Typically marketing. Um, but you know, it, it can be others, you know, the, the question is, well, what is this replacing in my tech stack? Right. You know, and, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's the right conversation. I think that, you know, often like it will be like, well, we're, we've got a data lake project. Why would I, why would I, you know, put my data yet in another place? You know, that sort of thing. And marketing's, well, I have, you know, my data in these four places. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think it's not a question of rip and replace. It's like, no, 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 let's bring this in so you can do the audiencing and uh, segmentation and orchestration um, across all of that and take advantage of the investments you've made in all of those tools. Um, we really like it, for example, when a customer's done a lot of uh, data warehousing, data lake, MDM type of work, um, because it makes our integration and time to value faster um, to stand them up and get them going with the work they've already done because we can bring that right in and start building audiences versus having to build like a master customer table and other things that they've already done that work. Yeah, they've done, they've done that. This is great. We love it. So I think that that's often a confusion is that, you know, this doesn't replace your CRM. This doesn't replace your marketing automation platform or your enterprise data lake strategy. This complements it and gives you rapid time to value for campaigns and audiences. Heidi, did you want to chime in there? I saw you trying to chime yeah. in. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think you're going to see it expanding the definition of what's marketing inside some of these companies. So what we've thought of traditionally is, uh, as pure marketing is expanding to different kinds of operations. David brought up the call center example earlier. That's one. Um, but there are other research organizations and wealth managers, for example, trying to connect research to how do I get that to the the advisor community that's going to need it the most. Mm -hmm. um, 
there are several yeah. of these. CRM is another great example. How do I take the data into my CRM if I'm a, a big insurer or a wealth manager and uh, make sure I consolidate that information and get it out in real time to that advisor so they know what to do with it. And then it comes back full loop from them after they've had that interaction. And you can uh, do some work with the full data set, not just the CRM, and continue to get better personalization in those contexts. Some of that would have previously been an ops function uh, in some of yeah, those firms. 100%. So I think, I think yeah, you'll continue to see that, that optimization happening across the, the ecosystem. Yeah, and that's a really good point to add on to your earlier question, Michael, which was, you know, what other data sources in, you know, all the things Heidi just mentioned, there's from every single one of those things, there's digital exhaust, right? Um, whether it's your, you know, marketing automation platform, which is recording all that like clicks and opens and all that, that sort of stuff, um, whether it's your call center with dispositions and call outcomes and other things, um, whether, you know, whatever it is, whether it's your CRM with campaign member status changes, all that stuff comes back in and is now available to enrich audiences through. And so that's just sort of changing the way you think about data sources as well, because all that comes back in and continues to, to grow your ability to be more effective with smart audiences. And I love the way, you know, Heidi, when you're talking about the, the different audiences and, and value propositions, because it's really turning the conversation instead of saying, well, what's the, what technology uh, do we need? It's like, what do we want to do? Who do we want to communicate with? What do we need to do to really resonate and engage with that audience across whatever channel? And then looking up the, you know, up the chain saying, what what is what is the right solution to be able to do all of that? Right. Well, I mean, it's tough, right? If you don't start the conversation with what business outcomes are we trying to affect? If you start the conversation with, I've got this great technology product. It's super fancy. Let's go put it somewhere. Right. That's that's yeah. tough. But if you yeah. know you're going to go solve for a set of business outcomes. Then you can look at the stack and say, well, we're solving for it in these places. We're not in these places. And oh, we've got some, uh, you know, some some things to unearth that we just can't get to because we don't know what the data is going to tell us because we can't see those insights anywhere today or we can't in real time. Um, so I think if you stay focused on what the business outcomes are, your, your chances of arriving in a better place are always going to are always going to increase. Do, do you guys find that? and we can go B to B here because I think that's kind of been a bit of a theme, right? Um, do you guys find that there is awareness of this space and, and even a, of Action IQ, or do you find that there's still kind of a, a, a fairly wide knowledge gap in, in, in the market? It's going to depend on the vertical, in my opinion. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, when you look at retail, you know, um, those are some of the earliest mm -hmm. and obvious use cases for CDP. So you see a lot of maturity there. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, when you get into B2B, um, it's probably less mature in terms of their understanding of the marketplace. And honestly, uh, up until pretty recently, there haven't been a lot of you know, enterprise level CDPs that, you know, have been purpose built to address the B2B business models in the way, you know, that, that some of sure. them can like, like Action IQ. Um, so I think that um, that's slowly starting to change, but I think, um, you know, when you look industry by industry, it's, it's gonna be a, a slightly interesting curve to look at. Retail is certainly very mature. I think you'll see like travel and hospitality is probably up there too. Um, yeah, that's but, what I was uh, thinking. What about the finance and insurance side of it, Heidi? It's the... same, similar to B2B. It's, it's, it's going to be a mix, but you've heard about it in some pockets and not in others. And places where you're, you've got traditional full stack players, uh, they're, they're just coming around to look at, at these smaller technologies to see what pockets aren't being solved for in their stack today that there might be a, a better way to unlock um, some of these use cases faster and, and get faster time to market and put, you know, put the data in the hands of their marketers to see if they can get to true real time micro segmentation that we've all been talking about for what seems like 20, 30 years now. So it's, it's coming around, but it's not all the way there for sure. Heidi, would you say that I'm just sort of curious too, from your opinion, being, you know, from that industry more, um, that 
it's probably a little more mature in say consumer banking and then when you get sort of outside of that when you get to multiple layers where you've got like insurance and other things where you got hierarchies like householding and other things to deal with that it starts to get less and less in terms of knowledge in the arena there Uh, absolutely the consumer the consumer banks digital only banks pretty familiar with with the space uh it's interesting just in the last couple of months we've seen a, a pretty decent spike in insurance companies coming to us to, to understand more about what we're doing and how we're doing it um <clears throat> Last year, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that was so. We were talking to insurers, but we were gonna. It was a bit hit or miss on who who knew about the space, who knew about us specifically, what would they do with it if they had it. Uh, that that tide seems to be turning a bit. That's great. That's yeah. Exciting. Well, I mean, it's a good fit for those types of organizations because they do have, as you as you know, Heidi, a lot of data that um, can be leveraged, and and oftentimes they don't have. The, the ability to to even access the data, let alone um, leverage it if if they had it, right? So that that's that's pretty exciting. Um, so I think that's probably a good place for us to 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 cut it. But I wanna I want to kind of leave the floor open. I guess mainly from a on that same sort of theme that we just had for people that are, I guess if if they're already aware of, of CDP, you know, why should they be giving you guys a call to learn about Action IQ if they're not already aware, and if they're not on a CDP, maybe why why they should give you guys a call to, to learn about it. Yeah. Uh, so, David, I'll, I'll three reasons that come top of mind for me, and then please chime in, especially sure. from the B two B perspective. But number one thing, having been on the side of the practitioner, is putting the power of the data in the hand of the marketer. I've said it several times throughout the the course of the day today, but that's just not something uh, our competitors can do. It's not something I've ever seen before. And it's really easy. I'm not a technical person. um, And I can sit in front of our interface and drag and drop and build audiences and not use SQL. And it's kind of incredible. It's good animals for for audiences, but yet with all the power and unlimited, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. And then you you had two other things. Sorry, I did jump in there. That's okay. Well, the other big one to me is is just the ability to scale. I mean, we don't have limitations on the size of data sets we can take in and um, and crank through. And I, I've not seen that kind of uh, ability to, to scale to that degree in the industry in all the years I've been around it. Uh, and just the last one, that that true ability quickly to get to micro segments, uh, the orientation audiencing and segmentation aspects of what the platform can do are not things that I've, I've seen um, the way that we present them and, and enable marketers to get them in market quickly to increase that time to value equation is uh, I think unparalleled, but David, I'll... yeah, and I think just awesome. to, to heap on to those points a little bit with a couple of extra ones. I mean, you know, everybody's seen an audience editor at some point, a segment editor, right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of what's special about Action IQ? I, I think you know we can demo that for you, and, and you'll get it pretty quickly. Um, the ability to iterate and riff and, and rapidly explore the data is just—it's more powerful. I've seen every kind of segment editor you can think of, and when I saw this, I was like, I get it, I get it now. <laughs> um, the other thing I would add, though, is you know, for the IT crew that might be sort of chiming in and listening in on this, is. You know, one of the things that we see a value of is, you know, when we come into any conversation where like, well, the word list pull is in the dialogue somewhere, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we know that that's a great opportunity. So if you're pulling list in any way or you're putting tickets into pull list or you have a team that's pulling list, you know, that's draining IT resources, right? That's, you know, you have someone has to go write those sequels, QA them, get that back to you. And then the marketers spit on it and go, that's not what I wanted. And then, you know, it's not a fun process for everybody. You know, once we're up and running in that, the, the thing at the point I would say here is we have really rapid time to value, but one of the really great things that IT teams love is, yes, they can still have governance and control over the data and the access and all of that. So, you know, that doesn't go away, but what it does do is allow them to take those resources that are busy writing SQL and pulling lists and put them on more valuable projects inside the organization that are probably on their backlog. Um, 
and I think that's really important when you think about yeah. resource management is yeah. you, every IT team has a backlog of stuff of projects, right? And if you could put the resources that are pulling lists for the business units onto those projects, um, that's a huge internal win for you. Um, and, and so I would say that's reason enough to call us <laughs> yeah. um, right yeah. there. 100%. And as the marketers, you know, you get access to the data in a way that, you know, you can drag and drop and build this stuff without, without needing to know SQL, without having to be technical, but, but really have fun, you know, interrogating that data in ways you never could. And I think, you know, when we saw it and, and got really excited about it, I actually went through the training myself, um, was it's still controlled. So on the theme of IT, yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a really important point is that there's still governance because th there is that ingestion process that ensures that this data is what it is. So when we talk about it's a little bit scary, I mean, that's partly why the walls went up to begin with to say, look, you know, pull a, you, we're going to run the list because we can't trust that you guys are working with the right data. Now we can actually trust that. Yes, you are working with the right data. So that's great. Don't put in a ticket to pull a list because I know as the, the IT leader, it's all good in there. Now, what you do with that, that's the second, you know, that's separate. But at least I know the data that you're working with is the right data and it's all good. So feel free to interrogate away because it's, it, you know, from my perspective, the data governance is, is, is happening, right? Yeah. Really great point. And that's often something, you know, when we stand up and implement Action IQ at a customer, IT is involved in defining those attributes that are available to the business, right? They're working side by side with you guys and our engineers to say, well, you know, what data do they need to actually do their jobs and answer the questions they want to answer, but they make it available to them through some other layers of the platform that aren't necessarily available to the business side, but they publish those variables, they publish those attributes to them so that they can go do that and IT knows it's done in a compliant and safe way. Yeah. And, and as a data driven marketer, you know, the idea that you are working with data that does have that level of, you know, that that governance, that cleanliness and being able to do that querying. So learning, making decisions, you can be so much more strategic. It's, it's really exciting. And I, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's just a huge game changer. Awesome. Very exciting. So actioniq.com, you said there's a market, what did you refer to it as there, David, a market overview, market? There's the CDP market guide. Market um, guide. It's downloadable off our website. And essentially what it is, it's a, um, and I can send you guys the link to publish with the podcast if you need to. Yeah, let's do that. Um, it's, uh, uh, but yeah, basically it's it's kind of Action IQ's view of the CDP marketplace. Okay. You know, because there's, Lots of lots of different solutions out there. Lots of noise in the space, and we've taken our, our our stab at sort of defining how we think things should be categorized and looked at. If anything, it's educational to help everyone understand what the landscape looks like. Awesome. Well, it's an exciting landscape. It's growing quickly, and like even to your point, Heidi, you know the 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 change in the winds, you know, within an eight month to a year period that that we're seeing in certain industries. Um, we certainly view it as like skating to where the puck is going, which is which is cool. Like in 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 this uh, in this uh, Martech world that we all live in. Um, so I, I think that's 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 for for people listening, get it on the radar if it's not already, and, and get you know in front of Action IQ to learn what they can to do for your business. Yeah, we value the partnership, and and we're looking forward to uh, you know to doing more with you guys. So with that, we'll end it. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Awesome.